Thank you. Hey guys, like Rex said, my name is Tiffany. Um, before, whoops, how do we get to, that's the wrong way. How do we get to my slides? Cool, okay. Um, so before I talk about Divi, just some context on myself. We've been working on projects that looked like Divi and then Divi itself for about two years. Uh, before this, I worked in growth equity, actually. So I've learned a lot of things the hard way over the last two years. Um, at Divi, I spend most of my time thinking about sales, growth, how to serve and understand our customer. And lastly, I lost my cell phone somewhere in the room. It's pink and it's not in a case. So if at any point during this you see it, let me know. So what do we do in a sentence? Divi is a fractional home ownership company. So rather than simply renting or simply owning, we want to offer our customers a third way that combines some of the benefits of both. So I'm going to talk about what we see as the problem we're solving, what motivates us to do it, our original thesis behind starting Divi, and then how we solve it. Just for context, this is a very serious and dignified photo of my colleagues. We are 17 people. We've been around as a company for about 18 months, and we've raised a little over $100 million so far to do this. So the problem that we're solving. Fundamentally, you can tell that US home ownership rates are below where they typically comfortably are at equilibrium. We think that there's sort of medium term five to 10 years ago reasons for this, but also very long term reasons for this. Home ownership rates are being hampered not just by you know, post financial crisis credit damage, with, which is actually still lingering on, bankruptcy stay on your record for seven years, but more fundamentally, very stagnant median wage growth. Home price appreciation in the US has been outpacing median wage growth for a long time. Americans certainly aren't getting any better at saving up a down payment. When you combine these, access to a mortgage and access to a credit, to credit becomes an increasing challenge. Yet, we don't believe that home ownership has really lost any of its luster. The vast majority of renters report that they still plan to own. They still tend to be pretty optimistic about their ability to own in the next five or so years. And I think what really struck us when we looked at this cohort of essentially missing homeowners, right? The tens of millions of Americans who, if things had continued as they were, would own a home today, but instead don't and are missing out on really trillions of dollars of wealth creation, is that the people who are most affected are really some of America's most vulnerable populations to begin with, right? Black Americans, young Americans, Americans without a high school, without a college education and single parents have been worst affected by this decline in homeownership rates, which ultimately poses a fundamental problem when it comes to just equity and access, right? And the ability to create financial stability for you and your family. So the outcome of this is that you have tens of millions of frustrated tenants, right? Rents are increasing, home prices are increasing, they're not seeing their wages increase. All types of debt, student loan debt, medical debt are increasing. And so caught between these two, they find themselves unable to own, spending a massive amount of money on rent every year. So Divi aims to solve this by taking the traditional single family rental model and essentially reversing it. So instead of going out there, like say Invitation Homes, which you guys might be familiar with, it's America's largest single family REIT, and acquiring tens of thousands of properties that through whatever complex analysis we think are going to be a good investment and then trying to put renters in them, we're actually customer centric as opposed to asset centric. So we acquire future homeowners, not properties. Our customers then choose a home and we buy it for them. So as I said, they get to pick from any home for sale, we own it and they're going to lease it back from us However, unlike a normal lease, we want to provide a path to home ownership, which involves a couple differences. The first one, which we just talked about, is the fact that this was a home of their own choice. This is really critical because not only does it heighten their commitment to the property, it lowers likely, likelihood of default, property damage, all of that kind of thing, but it's also really critical because the stock of single family homes for sale 
is not at all equivalent to the stock of single family homes for rent. And so in many cases, we are our customers' best shot at getting their kid into a great school district, living in a safer neighborhood, all kinds of desirable outcomes for both themselves and the community. So that's the first really big difference. The second difference is that we are going to actively help them save up a down payment as they rent. So about a fourth to a fifth of our average payment is not in fact classic rental revenue, but is money that they're paying us and that we're saving up on their behalf so that they can get a down payment sometime in the next three years. Our current program is three years long. Unlike traditional rent to own, which most people in San Francisco are actually quite unfamiliar with, but most people in our demographic in the Midwest and the Southeast are very familiar with, unlike traditional rent to own, even if our plan does not work out and they don't get the mortgage, they've still built up a substantial amount of savings which we're then able to cash back out and share appreciation with them. So either way, as a renter, they're still enjoying that wealth building effect of home ownership and of access to their local real estate market. From our perspective, so stepping back from the customer's perspective for a minute, we're actually solving many of the classic problems that have hampered single family landlords. One of the things that really struck me when we first started looking at the solution and exploring Divi was the fact that single family REITs have really only been around for 10 years. Given the size and attractiveness of single family homes as an asset class, honestly, it kind of blew my mind. But when we look at the things that analysts are dinging, like invitation homes or American homes rent or colony homes on, right? It's really high maintenance costs compared to multifamily. You have to have so many property managers in every single little zip code you operate in. Default rates and cost of those defaults, right? Vacancy. Because our tenants are uniquely aligned with Divi, they don't think of themselves as renting a home from Divi. They think of themselves as a homeowner who happens to currently be in a lease, but any month now will get out of it. We're really solving those problems and operating a single family rental company that's much more scalable. We don't have the same employee headcount. We actually have virtually no employees in market because our tenants truly treat the home like their own. So when you combine those two, the customers are getting homes that they love that they would otherwise never have access to. Our investors get better returns than they would from any comparable single family home opportunity. In terms of how we make this happen, I wanna highlight a couple interesting attributes. The first one is that we have a really interesting distribution model. Um, the slide's a little bit old right now, about half of our homes actually come from non-paid channels, which is awesome. And specifically, we're able to have such strong networks on the ground in Cleveland, Atlanta, and Memphis, which are three markets, not San Francisco. I'm really sorry. We're asked that a lot. Um, because we fit into the way the existing real estate industry in those cities likes to operate. From their perspective, what's amazing about Divi is that we're actually creating incremental new buyers. Pretty much every real estate tech company that comes and pitches them is saying, here's a way for you to outcompete, you know, Berkshire, outcompete Coldwell Banker and everyone else in pursuing that same one in four Americans who's actually mortgage ready. Divi is unique because we're bringing fresh new customers to the table that other people would normally not have access to. We've actually had a little over 1500 real estate agents sign up and refer us clients which is incredible because we've actually never intentionally acquired any of them. And when we looked into how they even found out about Divi to come here and sign up and send us clients, what we heard is that agents, as you might expect, basically lurk around the purchase agreements and the dot loops of their own brokerage to see who's buying a lot of homes. Since we've got this great flywheel effect that the more clients are referred to us, the more homes we buy, every single other agent in that brokerage is gonna be like, who is this Divi that bought so many homes from us last month and how can I get in on this? And so we've seen really rapid growth in agent participation. Um, I can't talk to this as well as the next slide, but if you guys are interested in anything you see here, you should go talk to Alex, who's wearing a blue shirt and sitting in the back row, my colleague. Um, but some of the other challenges we run into there, I, I think are quite interesting and, and unique. Underwriting is really different for us because we have many of the same fundamental concerns as a mortgage provider, but we're trying to forecast into the future rather than evaluate your state today. 
So as a landlord, we need to know that you can afford our rent comfortably today. But as a rent to own company, we also need to know that you're going to get your credit to a good point, your income to a good point, your debt payments to a good point in zero to three years. So we have to have a sense of your trajectory. And this is really unique for us and I think really interesting because so many of our customers are coming to us with a really strong upward trajectory. We get to be part of that story where, you know, maybe four or five years ago, they had a medical event, a divorce, something like that is very typical. And they had a really tough time, but they've really been improving their situation since then. And we need to understand that velocity for them. We also get to be really creative because even though we're dealing with some of these mortgage type concerns, we are not a lender, we're a landlord. And so we don't have the same regulatory burden. We can be really, really creative. We can do things like underwrite purely off of bank statements. Once the tenant moves in, there's actually an interesting component of consistent re-underwriting. As they pay their rent, as they continue to improve their financial situation, we need to continuously evaluate their mortgage readiness and coach them into buying the property back. So that's a really interesting challenge. Pricing is another really key challenge for us. We need to set market rent. We need to set their future buyback price. And we need to set each year's incremental strike price as they're saving up down payment and buying equity credits in their home for every single property as soon as it hits the MLS and also some random properties that never hit the MLS that people somehow find. So that is a really, that's quite a unique challenge for us. I think the, re the single family rental pricing in particular is intriguing. There's a lot of sophistication out there when it comes to forecasting appreciation across all of Cleveland, but there's, because there's so little institutional money still relative to the size of the single family home market, there's very little sophistication when it comes to figuring out why rents are higher on the east side of Cuyahoga County as opposed to the west. We have our a custom built internal ledger system because we need to track essentially the cap table, AKA Divi versus tenant ownership perspective. Um, maintenance costs, every single plumber bill, every single new coat of paint, payment history for each individual house, which is incredibly complex and a ton of effort has gone into that. And then lastly, we're currently buying about a, do about a dozen and a half homes per sales team member per month, which means that our home buying transactions need to be incredibly systematized and automated. We are really planning on 10xing the number of homes we buy this year compared to last year. And despite my protestations, we are not 10xing the number of people on the sales team. So we have to make that happen. On the business side, I think some of the unique things we deal with I found that simply having a high volume of direct to consumer sales is a fairly unique problem. The way we work, who we need to hire, how we structure our sales process is very different than the sort of B2B business development guy passes it to an AE kind of situation that you normally see in San Francisco. So we're having thousands and thousands of phone conversations with customers per month guiding them through a 30-day high-touch application and home shopping process, which is for them the biggest financial decision they've ever made, deeply emotional. They're like packing up their wives, they're pulling their kids out of school to make this happen. So it's an incredibly huge commitment on their part. And honoring that and facilitating it remotely is really tricky. And it means we've had to become incredibly serious about processes and automation, I think a lot earlier than comparable companies at our stage. Relatedly, that agent base I mentioned, that is almost a whole nother business unto itself, working with this many agents across three cities where policies, purchase agreement preferences, how they like to do things vary really from zip code to zip code. And then lastly, as you might imagine, there are lots of on the ground operations. I cannot tell you how many crazy, colorful 1 a.m. calls we have gotten about various toilet related issues and tree falling on garage related issues and neighbor's dog is somehow in my house related issues. So operationally, this is very complex. If you work in residential real estate, you'll know that closing in 14 days is quite a feat and handling the maintenance and care of hundreds of these homes with really for two out of our three metros, zero on the ground team members is also incredibly complex. So that's a bit about, I'll go back maybe a slide. Um, that's a bit about how we do what we do. Um, in keeping with the previous speaker's 
way of framing this, which I really enjoyed. I think some of the things that have surprised me as we've worked on Divi and that I've taken away from it, the first thing is we did approach our company with an initial pretty like ivory tower intellectual bent to this, right? Like, oh, single family home should be fractionalized. This totally makes sense um, when we compare this asset class to other asset classes. But when it came to how do we actually implement fractional home ownership in a way that can scale quickly and that's meaningful, we saw the most traction with this idea and were able to be so decisive really from the first call we got off a of Craigslist post when we were testing this because we found that we were solving an acute pain point. And my belief is when you're asking an average person to work with a risky unknown startup on really any kind of financial transaction, but especially something in prop tech, a major financial transaction, it makes sense to go after someone with an acute pain point, not an inconvenience, not a slightly better rate, not a normal mortgage application, but with like a nice mobile interface or something like that. We're solving a problem that keeps our customers up at night, that they are stressing about day after day. I have a family, I have a kid, I wanna put them in a home, how do I do this? How do I get into that, into that house or into that neighborhood? So that's incredibly meaningful. And in our search process, I think we really followed not just customer demand, but customer enthusiasm. We tried a lot of things and were able to get people to sign up for a whole host of exotic offerings. I think we sold three vacation homes at one point in Tahoe, but this was the only idea we pursued where the customers actually pursued us and would call us if we forgot to call them back and would nag us if we forgot to get back to them. I think the other thing that you can probably tell from this list of challenges that surprised me was although we originally conceived of Divi as very much a housing finance company, a fintech company, right? Emphasis on the fin. We're offering just a new type of lease. It's really not that simple. We have to offer a completely different home buying experience. We have to offer a completely different landlord experience. We have to offer a completely different credit counseling experience. And so the end to end of that actually consumes a lot more time and it's just a lot more complex than just the financial pricing of it. Um, and I think the last thing is that just to go back to the first couple slides, um, I think we've gotten lucky and had really good timing. Um, we've happened across an offering that fits with, I think, both short and long-term trends, and so we have a lot of those tailwinds, and it's probably made things immeasurably easier. So, yeah. Thank you for listening. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, <laughs> it, it sounds like your investors need an exit within three years. Is that correct? We own the homes. You own the homes. Yep, and we hold them on balance sheets. So we, we do intend to end the program for each tenant within three years, right? After three years, you either buy the home back or we split the cost of selling the home, cash you out, share in the appreciation. So, so, um, so the homeowner has a three year term to live, yep. live in the house. What is the financial benefit to the homeowner? For doing yeah. yeah, so for the rent, after tax, I assume you take the property tax deductions, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the finance uh, the deductions on your taxes rather than the homeowner. Yeah, so our customers are not on title. They are not homeowners and they're renters, right? And so we generally don't comp ourselves against the mortgage where we say, oh, Divi is more beneficial than a mortgage. Right now, the way we're structured, we typically are a route to a mortgage. And so we are paying property taxes, paying insurance, all that stuff. If there are you know, like tax benefits to that, that would be realized by us. Our customers are paying market rent, no more, no less, but they get to pay market rent on a home of their choosing, build up a down payment, have an exclusive right to buy it back. They get to have dogs, they get to modify the home, they get to really treat the home as their own, and they get to buy it back at a preset price. So I actually find that Access to the home aside, the two biggest benefits to the homeowner are one, just a reduction in uncertainty. We, our customers typically find themselves on that annoying treadmill that a lot of people in San Francisco are on, where you save up 5,000 for your down payment and then home prices have gone up so much that you need 7,000 and by the time you save up the next 2,000, they've somehow gone up another 1,000. Divi eliminates that, right? We tell you this is the price you're gonna buy it back at, you're gonna have enough down payment for the mortgage you plan to get, in month 11 and a half 
And all of this is already figured out for you. So as long as you make your payments and stick to the plan, you'll be a homeowner. So that's the first biggest benefit. I think the second biggest benefit is that our customers find it a lot easier to commit to that fairly intense savings program, repair their credit, do whatever else they need to do, because they now have a concrete goal, which is they're living in the, their motivating factor. And so in terms of being a forced savings mechanism, we're not just a forced savings mechanism. We are really putting them in that house and reminding them of their goal every day. And we've seen it improve success rates. Yeah. Laws. So, for instance, in, in uh, San Francisco, uh, rent control property, if you try to kick someone out, you have to pay them like $100,000, just even if their lease is up. So, yeah. I'm just curious, is that something that you're seeing in certain areas that you would avoid uh, for your business, or as in the places you are, do you not have that problem? In Cleveland, Atlanta, and Memphis, tenant protections are not as complex, shall we say? as California. They really aren't as complex anywhere as in California. Um, in most states, even in California, single family homes are actually exempt from those laws, which largely apply to multifamily. So that is convenient. To be honest, we do operate in a metro like Cleveland, which has tremendously complex county by county varying property standards for how, you know, for what a house has to be to be compliant and rentable. We're willing to do that because when we compare our returns to any other investor who still needs to eat those same costs in Cleveland, we're still experiencing you know, an improvement. Um, the biggest reason we're not in California actually, well, the biggest reason we're not in the Bay Area is because the average rent yield here is like 0%. The biggest reason we're not in California is because as a startup with a lower risk tolerance than we will have someday in the future, we like to be in markets where appreciation is solid, dependable, not volatile, and nothing crazy. So Cleveland's not gonna give you a 9% one-year appreciation rate like certain cities in California, but it's also not gonna have a sharp plunge, right? It's an incredibly stable market, so it really suits us for now. How does the dating model handle depreciation and property values over the three-year time horizon and or restriction in the credit market for the people trying to finance the property and the marketplace type of credit? Yeah, so we do absolutely bear some home price risk. The great thing is, our rent yields right now are so strong that really home prices in our three markets would have to go down by more than 15% for us to not break even. So the unit economics are pretty incredible. Again, we've very specifically chosen markets where we don't really see that large of a dip happening, perhaps a slowdown, but nothing that dramatic. Long term, the answer is really just geographical diversification, like anyone who's gonna own a bunch of single family homes you know, explore different types, different capital structures that get some of the risk off your plate. Um, there's really no silver bullet. We're in the single family home business and that means single family home depreciation would not be great. The other kind of interesting thing about our model is that because we are a landlord, even if, for instance, the number of originated purchased money mortgages are going down, right, and there's credit tightening, those families by and large still have to live in a single family house, right? They need the backyard, they need to live in that neighborhood. And so actually, when the number of originated mortgages falls, single family rental demand tends to go up. So, you know, we, there would be pros and cons, but we would at least benefit in some way from an event like that. Uh, you mentioned the beneficial fly bill for real estate agents coming yeah. on board, but can you explain more about how you could customers and speak um, yeah, so like I said, um, about 40 to 50 percent of our tenants come from agent referrals. And so that's actually, I think, our most interesting channel. And like I said, our message to them is really give us your unqualified leads. You know, we'll turn them into gold kind of thing. The rest of our customers come from pretty standard channels, you know, paid advertising, some organic. We just uh, started playing our first radio ads in Cleveland and Atlanta, which is really fun. If for some reason anyone listens to like soft rock in Cleveland, you know, you will hear that. Yeah. Can you talk about operationally what it takes to launch a Divi in a new market? Yeah, uh, it's, it's more complicated than I originally thought. 
Um, so the biggest thing we need to launch a new market, we do a lot of the, we have a lot of the typical needs a startup would have, right? You need to like drum up demand for probably like three to five weeks before you actually open there, you build up a wait list, et cetera, et cetera. We need a lot more service providers on the ground than a typical startup. Um, so even aside from getting agent referrals, that's an incredibly high intent lead. So I would like to have agent networks and referrals coming in before we launch. But even besides that, we just need dependable inspectors, title people, agents, all of that. Um, so that's actually surprisingly, surprisingly complex. Honestly, beyond relationship building and some amount of getting our name out there, because we're a landlord and not a lender, our overhead's quite low. There isn't a ton of state-based regulatory demands we have to meet or anything like that. We could probably spin up a new market um, in either one very stressful month or like two normally paced months. Yeah. So what happens uh, for the three, three years if the, the client is paying to you, like the renter, and then uh, if we want to go to buy the property, so do you adjust that money or how does it work? So when the uh, customer is ready for a mortgage, all of the money that they've saved up for their mortgage goes to them for their down payment and if they so choose their closing costs. We don't deduct any. We are aggressively transparent about this, right? Like to the dollar. You have $2,498 saved up. That is, that is the sum. When you get a mortgage, every dollar of that is going to go to you for your down payment. You said um, at one point that the um, the investors are making a certain return that's higher than the yeah. market, and then you said that the properties aren't on balance sheet. Can you explain that and how much are the investors making on average? Yeah, so we're structured like a normal SF startup. So we have like equity investors like everyone else. Um, and we hold the homes on the balance sheet. So for our own purposes right now, we're essentially those investors in this real estate portfolio. If you were to imagine us as like a public single family REIT, right? Those investors would be making a higher return on each dollar of asset value for us than on a comparable, really I think REIT in general, but certainly single family REIT because they're going to be experiencing those cost advantages that we talked about, right? Even today at our relatively minute scale compared to someone like Invitation Homes, we have lower maintenance costs, we have lower eviction rates, we have lower payment delinquency rates, even though we're working with a population that can't even access normal mortgage. I think that's just because our incentives are so much more powerfully aligned than you know, a normal tenant and a landlord. I think a landlord is really the caricature of like the guy that people hate. So we're trying to do something very, very different in that relationship. Oh, sorry. Uh, quick question. For the rent, the renters are paying. Are you guys also like the custodianship for those rent? Or like, for example, you can like, like reinvest, reinvest those or, or those are kind of like deposited somewhere else, like a bank partnerships or something? Yeah, so the rent that they pay is revenue to us. So we could do whatever we want with it. The interesting and complex part are those equity credit payments or those down payment savings, right? Because we need to give those back to them, we do not do whatever we want with them. <laughs> we absolutely need to set them aside. Hence, part of the reason for a ledger system, right, is again, you cannot misplace a single dollar. We have made promises to those customers and we take them really, really seriously. So they're set aside. One more question. Okay. Um, yeah, I was uh, going to ask how you uh, plan to compete with companies like Open Door Point once they come to the market and decide to do something similar. Uh, I know they're focusing on places like Phoenix, Orlando, Las Vegas, you know, some of the most appointed places where, again, rent's high. Uh, they can go through and succeed. Yeah. Because we are a landlord, I don't know if we're really going to run into each other anytime too soon. In a way, us and something like Unison or Point are kind of opposites, right? They're serving people who have equity and need to turn it into cash, and we're serving people who have cash and need to, in the future, turn it into like a down payment slash home equity. So to be honest, I would be a little bit surprised if someone like Open Door wanted to operate as a landlord because what you need to set up is so different than if you're only going to hold the home for like 30 days and you're focused on being a brokerage and selling it. To the extent that we do run into competition, certainly like every single market has local rent to own probably like dozens and dozens of companies. I think we 
differentiate ourselves in a couple ways. I think that we're able to underwrite really creatively. And when you look at who gets approved and who doesn't and for how much, even at this point, to me, it can be counterintuitive because when you're dealing with um, the, a, low in, a low income and middle income customer, they actually have much more complex financial lives right, than a white collar yuppie. They have many different income streams. They deal heavily in cash. And it actually takes a lot of work to be able to intelligently pick out who in that muddle of transactions and blurry pay stubs, and they have seven different bank accounts and three prepaid debit cards is actually consistently meeting their obligations and is going to be a good tenant despite appearances. So I think that's one kind of defensible element. I also think our on the ground relationships and this network of agents who are, many of whom are becoming quite dependent on Divi is very defensible. These agents, start out sending me, you know, sending us like one, one client a week. And probably for our top dozen or so in each city, we are, if not their entire business, almost their entire business. They stop working with any non-Divi clients. So I think that'd be a very painful switch for them, which is great. Cool. Do I? Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Awesome.